Hello, my name is Rob Neufeld, and I have with us today Anne B. Ross, the author of 12 Miss Julia books, bestsellers, and well-beloved works of fiction. Let's get a look into the Anne B. Ross and, and the Miss Julia universe, because it started <laughs> off, as, as you said, it started off with that vision of Miss right. Julia. You've told the story a few times. But... Right, right, I have. Uh, and actually, I'll go back just a little bit because it really started before the vision, the image, in that I was hearing all of these sharp, acerbic comments in the back of my head, and I realized there were things that I wish I had said sometime or, or that some people needed to be told, <laughs> and, uh, but I'd been too strictly raised to say out loud myself. And then when the image of this older woman with her white winter coat and a little hat and her pocketbook dangling from them and the little boy came. It took me a while to put them together that this woman had something to say mm. and that she had a specific unique voice. And uh, when I figured out who that little boy was, that's when the stories really started. Well, how did you figure that out? How did, well, how did the little boy come into being? <laughs> of course, he was there from the beginning with her when I first began to see this image and uh, I just went in my mind to you know I knew that she had never had children she just had that um, the sense of that she was uncomfortable with this child and so I knew immediately that she was childless and that meant he could not be her grandchild and so I thought about perhaps he's a neighbor's child maybe a foster child, but it didn't sound like her that she would do that. And all of a sudden, it just, when I realized that he, this child, was her dead husband's child, that's when things really started going. Now, the dead husband story is an interesting one also, because Miss Julia is, was vulnerable to making a bad choice. It, it, in not taking the child? Is no, that in marrying. Oh, marrying him, but yes, yeah, she lived, a lot of us made bad choices mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to marriage. Uh, and she lived with him for over 40 years. Mm. And not, she would not, I don't think, have said that she was unhappy, but not, could never say that she would, had ever been really in love. And she was satisfied, happy, content, in the role that had been provided for her. The wife of a successful man, pillar of the church, she did everything right and expected others to do everything right. And then when he proved, after he died, when she learned what his life had really been, that just shattered everything. But it also opened her eyes to the fact that she could write a few checks, uh, she could vote on her own, she could do pretty much what she wanted to, and yet he had always uh, told her what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting seeing the flowering of Miss Julia. Right. This is what right. we're seeing. Yes, yes. And for a lot of women, uh, that flowering often comes at the end of the first codependent marriage. That is very, very true. Mm. Very true. And maybe that's part of the appeal mm. of the books. But Miss Julia's busting out all over, and by the way, <laughs> Miss Julia busts out all over. It's not <laughs> oh. But she's, she's busting out in, in many ways, including, um, as you were saying before, the uh, ability to take action. Yes. And yes. the ability to make remarks. Right, right. She can speak. Now, some one reader pointed out, well, Miss Julia doesn't actually say a whole lot. She thinks a whole lot, and we read her thoughts and so on. But she does take action, and uh, and just and, but she feels the freedom, mm. and that makes all the. And what is, I think, one of the best parts of these things is that uh, Sam loves her for it. Mm. You know, he's not threatened by what she. Now he tries to calm her down because she's kind of uh, wants to go her own way too much, so she doesn't, you know, she doesn't want to disturb her husband, so she didn't tell him everything. <laughs> Now, Sam has uh, some difficulty sometimes dealing with her, does he not? Right, he does, he, because he thinks she 
goes off on her own too much and so on. But uh, I got an email from a woman who said that she loved my books and she wanted to know if uh, Sam had a Canadian brother. She's from Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> really? So does that mean that she knows someone who is like Sam? No, actually, I wish I did. <laughs> I know. No, well, no. Let's still go there. Do you find that uh, people are uh, uh, more attracted to Sam or to Mr. Pickens? You know, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure. It may be about half and half. Yeah. Because they really do write to me a lot about him. Mm. And uh, but I tell you who they write to me about more than anything. They love Lillian. Oh yeah. Yeah. They would like to know where they could find a Lillian. Mm. But when it comes to Lillian, Sam, or Mr. Pickens, I tell them all, if I find one, I'm keeping them, not sending them off. That's what we need to do in our life, find right. the keepers. <laughs> yes. Isn't that what life is all about? <laughs> well, let's talk about Lillian then. Okay. Because um, she is a very fully realized character. Thank you. And, you know, sometimes you, you feel that she's a little foolish, but very frequently, She's the sensible one. Yeah, absolutely. Does Somebody this... called her the voice of reason. Yes. In the books. Is she sometimes foolish? How do you balance that? The foolish no, isn't well, the best word. What, no, what word would no. you use for the balance of her character? Uh, mm, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that because I always think of her as balancing Miss Julia. Because she's superstitious. She is superstitious, but that, you know, um, I, I have gotten four, I think, emails over the whatever it is, 12 years that these books have been out, criticizing me for the way I portray Lillian, that she should have more perfect English and so on, but that's not what she is. Only four? Yeah. That's nothing. I know. Yeah. But I, you know, I write back and say, treasure your heritage. Mm. Really? Universities are teaching that sort of thing now. So anyway, I won't go into that. But um, My apologies, by the way, to the four people who did email. <laughs> I, I didn't mean them to call them whatever I called them. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the, people who did not grow up in the South uh -huh. have a hard time appreciating the positive elements of the relation between the races in the South, pre-integration, pre-civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so Mr. Miss Julia Lillian relationship is a, is a model. Now Lillian is, what do we call her? Housekeeper is too limited a term. Uh, yeah, housekeeper, friend, whatever. And she's uh, the confidant, she's the main. She absolutely is, and that, that's the role that she plays in, in the books. And she's paid to be the housekeeper. Right. But everything else, the relationship between the children, Right. And uh, her daughter's name is Letitia? Yeah, great-grandchild. Great-grandchild, mm -hmm. Yeah, course. Letitia. Uh -huh. um, and she and Lloyd share a bedroom one night. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, they're sleeping on pallets, but anyway, they, that's true. Yeah. But, but she's young. She's five years old. Good gracious. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm suggesting is, is, uh, is not the romantic aspect. I'm suggesting the, the racial aspect. Oh. But see, people who are not born in the South mm. look at it entirely different. That's what I'm saying. Now, we're not, you know, uh, when the weather's bad, Lillian stays over. She's got her own room there, and, uh, and they sit and have coffee together. Uh, it's just natural. And, and a tremendous amount of dignity. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I think you've only created a couple of characters who cannot be said they have a tremendous amount of dignity. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't know which two characters you're thinking of. <laughs> no, I, I have to confess, I, I have no, not read Hoochie all Who's done, I, maybe. <laughs> what about Dr. Fowler? Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Why shouldn't we go there? <laughs> oh, me. Dr. Yeah. Fowler appeared in two it, of the books. Yes, he did. The first one, and I can't... Uh, uh, I think I... Not, not, not too far back. He appeared, it, he, oh, not too far back. He appeared in Renews Her Vows. Okay, yeah. Yes, he, he Oh, he's the, cha to, he's the challenge. Yeah, he, he's the one that's offering this uh, 
marriage enrichment mm -hmm. course. You ought to look on, on the web and see all these things that they offer like mm -hmm. that. It's interesting. Anyway, not for Julia. <laughs> well, I, I suppose that's part of the fun of writing Miss Julia. You get to look at modern society. Yes. Right? And then comment on yeah, it. Yeah, Let her on. comment on it. I'm, I'm denying everything. So <laughs> where's, where's your notepad? Or <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I run home. Um, speaking of that, I pick up ideas where, wherever I go. And one year, I was on tour in New Orleans. And they, I was in a hotel and was at dinner that night and they had set me over a little two table by the wall because I was by myself. And right over here was a large round table and there were oh seven or eight obviously local women who were having a night out. And I couldn't help but overhear their conversation. And by the time they finished, I was upstairs making notes as fast as I could. <laughs> because in that, I was working on the particular book where Mildred Allen's son, Tony, mm -hmm. comes home. And, uh, uh, you know, he's been up north, and it just ruined him because he comes home as Tanya. Right. And that's what I had heard these women talking oh. about, about a young man who had had surgical change and so I included that in that book and it was a lot of fun to do that. That was uh, I think by cultural standards not by mine mm -hmm. one of the more shocking introductions that you've made into your fiction so if you're looking around to bring something into this into Abbotsville that's going to yeah. cause a stir uh, that well the criminals aside, let's put it, the criminals are in a different category. <laughs> right, okay. But the, the loved people, mm -hmm. the people who are embraced, mm -hmm. I mean, Miss Julie will embrace just about anyone, won't she? Well, she she's learning to do that, mm. absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, she lived too many years of uh, excluding certain people in mm. certain groups, and then when, um, when Wesley Lloyd showed how Feudal, that sort of life is, and she has really opened up. And I was telling somebody this morning, they say that in a novel, your protagonist should learn something or grow in some way. And so I try to do this a little, at least a little bit in every book. Wow. And, uh, and that's pretty amazing. So now that you have 12 books. I know. I mean, how that's... much more can she learn? <laughs> I guess that's a good question. Yeah. If you have an answer to that one, we're, oh, we'll, okay. be, we'll be uh, happy to be entertained. Otherwise, yeah. we'll move along right now. Um, but you brought in J.D. Pickens. Yes. He came in pretty early. Yeah, second book, second I believe. Book, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which really gave uh, uh, more of a detective novel kind of an impetus to your well, fiction. Yeah, well, see, I love to read those books, mm -hmm. and I would love to be able to write you know, a really realistic one, and, and I can't, but... Um, because he is a I private investigator. Yes, he's a private investigator. And then I have Coleman Bates, mm -hmm. who is a deputy sheriff. He's He's been promoted. He's now sergeant. So I get a little bit of that in. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me, I never planned these things, that so much, so many of the plots in the different books turn on, on a legal situation. So we've got Sam's a retired mm -hmm. lawyer, Binky is a lawyer, and um, so I'm getting in that kind of thing a little bit. Well, you know what I love, one of the things I love about your books? What? If it were, if it were like an HBO series, uh -huh. they, they, they would be no category. You know, sometimes it would be a, a CSI kind of a thing. Yeah. And sometimes it would be a comedy. Uh -huh. And sometimes it would be a romance. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like... a little, a little, well, see, that's the problem because a lot of the reviews that I get, particularly out of the north, um, make the, the the comment that the mystery is not much, a very poor mystery. That sort of, well, I'm not writing mysteries, and yet my publisher puts them out as mysteries and as humor and as Southern fiction. Mm. So people pick them up and thinking they're a mystery and they're not, mm. but whatever. I do not want Miss Julia to be compared to Miss Marple. She is not Miss Marple. Mm. 
<laughs> well, so we don't even need we don't need to compare it to anyone because Miss Julia, uh, the Miss Julia books have established such a reputation. Other books have to be compared to it. Oh, right? I wish, <laughs> Rob. How nice of you to say. <laughs> um, Goodness sake. But yes, I mean there are some uh, writing comedy. In some ways, I think it's harder than writing suspense. A suspense, the pattern of suspense is. You think things are bad, it's getting worse. <laughs> That's and, true. And the pattern of comedy, it seems a lot it's more subtle. Oh, I, I mean, that's simplified. Well, yeah, right, right. But uh, now what, what I do, I, I don't depend on specific scenes for the comedy. I depend on dialogue. Mm. I love to write dialogue. And Miss Julia's thinking, mm. her comments. And, of course, her comments may not be agreeable to a lot of people, but mm. they're hers. And I lo just love to write dialogue. Mm. Now, do you find a way to get into the voices of not only her, but also your other characters? You know, I have not done that because uh, these are first-person narratives. Mm. And, uh, so it's what's, what Miss Julia is hearing. Yeah, mm. yeah, she reflects that. Um, and, and it's easy for me to slip into Miss Julia's persona and hear her voice and write what she's thinking or her comments with other people and that sort of thing. And I'm not sure I could write a third person narrative now mm. since I've been doing this. Mm. I'll have to try it one day. But you know, when the other characters speak, even though it's Miss Julia's narration, I mean, they have distinct, they own sp yes. they have distinctive yes. voices. Yes, I try to do that. I try to do that very much so. And do you have, Mr. like, when you go to write Lillian's voice, mm -hmm. how do you get into that voice? I hear it in my head. You do? But see, I grew up in Georgia. Right. And uh, of all the characters, Lillian is probably the closest to an actual person I've known. Okay. Um, now, Sam, I have a feeling that more is going to be happening with Sam because um, he's kind of in a supportive role. Yes, yes. Well, they all are. I mean, really. Uh, but what? <laughs> I never think ahead to the next book. Okay. I have to concentrate on what I'm doing. Uh, at the time, and then when I finish that book, I just hope for the best, <laughs> hope something else comes up. So, but I'll put that in the back of my head, Sam. Well, in this latest one, Miss Julia Rocks the Cradle, Cradle. Sam has an interesting relationship with James. Yes. His helper. Yeah. And Cook, housekeeper, yard man. It, it's it's kind of funny because it seems like when you have a universe as large as your Miss Julia books, that you could walk almost to any place in it and say, "Oh, look, I can do a, a, an Arthur, you know, Dudley Moore, Arthur okay. story. I could do a, a guy in his valet mm -hmm. story. This mm -hmm. could be lots of fun. Oh no, I'll, I'll just walk over mm -hmm. to this corner here. Do you walk? Or, do you I mean do you?" walk around your universe like that at all or <laughs> how do you visit your characters? And... Oh how do I visit them? Uh, they really are, the main ones are, are pretty real to me. Mm. They really are. Uh, one reader has asked me to include a map in my books mm -hmm. and I have sat down and tried to do it and it, of course I'm not a map maker for one thing <laughs> but as I, the, as I worked on it I really this really is not Hendersonville. Yes. It's just not, because when I need to have somebody come from across town, it immediately comes into my mind, but it has no relation to what is actually here. And somebody else wanted uh, a um, floor plan of Julia's house, and I couldn't do that. 
because when I need the stairs, they're there. <laughs> when I need a closet, it's there, but when you start to draw it, they don't always fit. Well, you know, uh, this is where the virtual world of the computer would be yeah, much more I useful. Guess, I guess you're right. Because you can like walk into a blank wall and all of a sudden it stares. You yeah. know, it's a virtual <laughs> environment. Had not thought of that. We'll, we'll hook thought. you up with a, a, all right. a programmer. <laughs> Well, that's very interesting. So uh, I, I love maps and books, but I think it's important to, to make the very clear point that Abbotsville is not Hendersonville. You're right, right. And but you know, even in Winnie the Pooh, you know, I used to love uh, looking at that map. Of yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what what was what was the problem you ran into when you started making the map? Were there blank spaces? I mean, could you do a Winnie the Pooh kind of a, uh, of a well, job on that? That's that's a thought. No, uh, getting... It's not even necessary for you. Right. You don't even need right. it. Right. Uh, I, I didn't have a big enough sheet of paper, mm. for one thing, because I made my blocks too big and then, you know, couldn't condense it. So see, let me see what you have. Oh, that's what I need. <laughs> Test water that? paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, You're writing your 13th um, Miss Julia novel now. Well, um, uh, let's talk about... Some uh, how in love with you, or how fresh is the 12th? Is Miss Julia Rocks the Cradle? Oh, now what are you talking about? How in love I am with that book? Or? Well, that too. That how, how, how do you feel about all your different book children? <laughs> do you remember well, them all? It, it, uh, you know, I do have a hard time remembering which book a certain thing occurred. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, but what really pleases me is I have gotten so many comments from my editor on down that Rocks the Cradle is the best one yet. And that's what I want to hear. I don't, you know, so often with the series, you kind of run out of gas and readers recognize that. And so I keep trying to tighten up and, and get some thing, different things in there maybe bring in some different characters and so on, so that they won't say, well, I loved your first books, but not so much the last ones. Mm. So I may have to go back and uh, in the 13th one and take the church on again. Okay, well, good, <laughs> that's a good segue. But that's, that's what I was talking about regarding your versatility. Uh -huh. The ability you're able to romance, a mystery, a comedy, that makes it, a, you've created a vehicle for yourself that I, that you can go with your passion. Now you, you don't get tired of it. I mean, Jan Karen took Father Tim out of Mitford. Yeah, she did. Yes, she yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, now, in this book, uh, in Miss Julia Rocks the Cradle, mm -hmm. um, I mean, th there are. I think that there are deep themes as well. And when I say deep, I don't mean, you know, you're gonna go off into an existential funk about it. Mm -hmm. But there are things that um, uh, really touch a number of things deep down in us. And I think one of them, I actually do think one of them is the role of gossip. How it's a positive thing in some cases and how it's a destructive thing in other cases and how Miss Julia, She's, that's, that's her at, at her best in some cases, how she deals Thank with it you. and how she says, oh, I don't gossip except sometimes with Lillian and, <laughs> yeah, right. oh, maybe with Hazel Marie You're sometimes. Right, yeah. Well, see, that's what I think when you, bringing that up brings out one of the fun things about writing and particularly writing in the first person is that I, I think the reader enjoys reading what Ms. Tudor says about herself but then seeing that she's got the wrong idea, mm. you know, getting both views of her. That, and, I'm, and that doesn't make a bit of sense. No, it does make <laughs> a bit of sense. People love knowing more. Yeah. Right. Yes, and yes, the author yes. or the characters. And I, and I especially. hope that, that they're compassionate enough that they can smile about that, mm. you know. Miss Julia says she doesn't gossip well. And it's tricky because you, you don't want to be too subtle and you don't oh. want to be too obvious. Right, right. And I think you do that extremely well. Oh, thank you. And it does thank create you. compassion for Julia. And it, we just, that's what we love about her. One of the things we love about her. Well, um, uh, Pastor Poppy Patterson. <laughs> you like her, don't you? Well, she's a new character. <laughs> right, she is. And it's also interesting because you already have 
Preacher Ledbetter. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like, and you're going to be taking on the church again. I don't know. Maybe. That's just, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But it seems that, um, you know, the role of a minister in a community, we're talking about bringing back the village. If we want to bring back the village with all of its love and its closeness and its tolerance of eccentricity and gossip, if we're going to bring back It Takes a Village, the minister or minister type of person is, mm -hmm. is critical. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, is that, an, is that too open a question? Talk about ministers, huh? I mean, and mm -hmm. what you expect of them, what the ideal is, oh, what goes wrong goodness. with them. Uh, and, uh, there I, we go. Um, you have three minutes left on this tape. <laughs> I don't know, but people, uh, it's interesting because I, I get some mail from readers saying I've never um, heard of a minister like Pastor Ledbetter. Well, I've known several, <laughs> almost exactly like him. And, uh, and so I wanted to, I, I've met some young women ministers, and I wanted to have somebody come in like that so that, you know, you can wear an off-the-shoulder dress. You can paint your toenails and wear high heels and still be a Christian, you know, like Somebody told me years ago, came up to me just out of the blue, and she says, I want you to forgive me. I have thought so bad of you because you wear eye makeup, but please forgive me. <laughs> I use that in one of the books. I've forgotten what it is. But, you know, that, that attitude, you have to laugh. People are funny. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, it's hard making sense of the world. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and so, you know, I've got somebody that that's a, sings in the Baptist choir, and now we've got Pastor Poppy from the Methodist, and, of course, Julia's from the Presbyterian. And, um, so, and, and I've got to get to the Episcopal Church sooner or later. So, And before uh, we finish talking today, we've, we've got to get to Thurlow Jones. <laughs> he becomes yeah. a, a, a major character in this book again. Yeah, yeah. And... You, you, you do wonder when Miss Julia is ever going to hug him, but <laughs> look at the experience. <laughs> that was a, was that shock or? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you see now that's a possibility. Well, some, doing something with Thurlow, and I, I don't know if you remember, but in this last book, um, he's kind of engaged with somebody. Oh, that's right. He's completely engaged. Completely different. I don't know if we want to tell. We no, we have a problem no, with we that. don't. We don't yeah. want. To, we don't. And but, I don't but, mean. That, Actual I meant right. interested He's, in. They're interested. Yeah. But, and when Julia embraces him, it doesn't have to be, again, romantic. Exactly. But I don't see yeah. her embracing him even <laughs> in any way whatsoever. Oh, he's so nasty. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> but uh, Pastor Poppy yeah. does such a job on him. <laughs> yeah, she does, doesn't she? She's great. Yeah, she, get, she gets him into church, and he just... <laughs> That was a fun thing to write. Because uh, I didn't plan that out. They just started talking, and that's the way it worked out. Well, that's why I like, That's you say you really like that Poppy Patterson. I like a lot of the characters, and she's one of the new ones. But the reason I like her so much is she's got a lot of play in her. And sometimes you must do this, too. When you develop a story or a character, you just sense how much potential they have mm, mm -hmm. to create, make right. things happen. Right. How much right. suspense there is. Right. And she, when she go, when she says to him, I think you know, um, she says to Thurlow, uh, who doesn't tolerate women in the position of ministers, right. you know, I am a fisher of men. Wink, wink. Right? It's like, oh man, <laughs> she's got a lot of play. Well, see, and I love, I love to use biblical allusions mm. without no quoting that sort of thing, but that kind of thing I love to do, and mm. of course. Many people recognize them. That's okay. Oh, that, well, that's uh, a, a big part of our literature. Absolutely. And you, you haven't had a, a Bible reading class in any of your novels, have you? With oh, different people good. saying different things. People interpret it. Yeah, and that's good. Well, actually, I have, well, you hadn't read this. I have written something about a Bible class. And of course, Julia is a, is a member of the Lila Mae Harding Sunday School class and right. has been for years. Okay. But um, good thought. Yeah. Because people, people go to the Bible and use it in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed, like, you picked out those three words? 
Uh, <laughs> never mind. Um, well, I, I think the overall impression that uh, we want people to have is that this, your, your, the world that you have created, and thank you for creating this world, oh, it's you. hard work. Yeah. I mean, really, just... a writer is a hard, being a writer is a hard job, a lot of work. Um, is that you've created so many air, nooks and crannies and places oh, yeah. to explore that mm -hmm. um, you can enjoy it so much and even want to, and especially want to know where you're going next. Oh. Now, what Jan Karen told her readers when she left Mitford was, you go on and write the Mitford stories. It's now a folk tale. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I had not heard that. And, and I scratched my head over that uh -huh. because I said, well, not everyone is as talented as you, Jan. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a nice idea. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. But your it's... world, I just love going everywhere in your world. Well, and... thank you. And there's, there's plenty of room for new ones to come in. Mm. And who knows, you know. Uh, like I mentioned last night, I've just been notified that they want two more books after the one in 2012. So it continues on. But I have, my job is now not to create characters. I've got a basic set of characters, but to uh, expand and to keep the interest up. Mm -hmm. Just got to do that. Can't slow down. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Thank, Thank you, you. Anne. <laughs> You're great. Thank you all, and keep the interest up, and <laughs> keep reading. Make more time for that, and uh, I look forward to your next novel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.